A Becoming Anti-Fragile listener, Lara, left a comment through Spotify a week or so ago on the episode with Leo Tolstoy where I quoted Confucius. She said, I love this episode. I was particularly fascinated by the Confucius quote at the end. You say from book 4-8, I tried to research it further but couldn't find anything. This inspired me to push up the episode on Confucius earlier. And that's why we're doing this. And by the way, if you have book recommendations or questions related to episodes I've done, you can email me at ij at becomingantifragile.com or you can leave a comment through Spotify. Without further ado, let's get into it. There is no creation myth or legend in ancient China. There is no Genesis, nor New Testament, nor Quranic equivalents, nor a Chinese Kronos or Zeus. And there is no affirmation in any ancient text, explicit or implicit, that the world is explanatorily intelligible. In both cultures, of course, the world is discernible for what it is through the testimony of the senses, that is, through appearances. But for the ancient Chinese, at least, the appearances were not deceptive. And the what and the why of the world, the existence of some underlying ultimate reality, does not seem to have preoccupied them. They did not, in other words, have any good reason for thinking that there might be an explanation of why the world is as it is, and thereby had no reason for seeking a transcendental answer to the question of why we are in this world. If our views on these issues are warranted, they will help to explain why Chinese philosophers in general, and Confucius in particular, were teachers in a very different way than their peers steeped in the Greek and Abrahamic traditions. For Chinese teachers do not seem to have been so much concerned with describing and thereby conveying knowledge about the world as they were to have their students learn how to get on in the world, which is clearly reflected in the written text. To be sure, language in the Western educational tradition is at times employed to assist students in learning how to be to get on in the world, but such recommendations are dependent upon complying with some true states of affair. In early China, the reverse seems to have been more nearly the case. The way the Tao is made in the walking of it. This is an excerpt from the introduction to the Analects of Confucius by the translators Roger T. Ames and Henry Rosemont. And the quote they used, the way is made in the walking of it. That quote has stuck with me ever since I read it. It sums up what this pod is about. And it is that to live in this world to act rightly, to be wise, you have to be the one who does it. Nobody else can live this life for you. Ultimately, you are responsible for your own life. It's important to note that, as the translator said, for Chinese philosophers, it was more about how to live in this world, not the abstract idea that the Western philosophies are often caught up in. And it's something that Epictetus, an episode that we've done, also criticizes when he says that we are often caught up in the abstract instead of learning and living in this world. So who is Confucius? Confucius is recognized as the first and the greatest teacher. His ideas have influenced Chinese cultural traditions for over 2,000 years. He was born around 551 BC in the ancient state of Lu. This was during a violent time when seven of the strongest states in proto-Chinese world vied for power and supremacy. And if you go to Monday China, people with the last name Kong, they're descendants of Confucius. The fascinating thing is that Confucius' teaching weren't influential during his time. It was mainly after his death that his teaching and ideas gained prominence. Eventually, his philosophies were implemented into Chinese cultural milieu, dictating the standard behavior for how people should live and act and treat each other and how you should respond to those in charge. And this also impacted the emperor himself. So during his lifetime, Confucius, because he wasn't accepted in Lu, which is the state that he was born in, he became a traveling philosopher who would be preaching his philosophies and ideas and trying to persuade politicians to adopt them because Confucius believed that the ideas would lead, if adopted, would lead to political stability and success. So what is the Analects of Confucius? The Analects of Confucius are sayings and teachings of Confucius. It's an ancient philosophical text, one of the most influential texts, if not the most influential text in human history. And the particular translation that I have is by, as I mentioned, Roger T. Ames and Henry Rosemont Jr. 
It's a newer translation of the Analects based on fragments that they found in the Dingshu province. So I think it's important to note here that if you have the Analects of Confucius and a different translation, and you might be wondering why you know, certain things are translated the way they are, it's because the translators use this fragment, which was found in 1973, to help with their translation. And they write, we have indicated the individual notes to our translation, those several places in which the Dingzhu texts have provided important clarification and alternative readings for the text. So this fragment dates back to 55 BC and is considered the earliest analects discovered. The analects is split into 20 books. Each book can have up to 20, 30 stanzas where Confucius is either speaking directly, which is often written as the master or Confucius, or sometimes it's one of his students speaking, and other times it's a whole story that's being told in, from the perspective of a student who is journeying with Confucius. So this quote is another one that has stuck with me ever since I read it in this book, and it's from book two, four, and it says, the master said, from 15, my heart and mind was set upon learning. From 30, I took my stance. From 40, I was no longer doubtful. From 50, I realized the propensities of Xian. From 60, my ear was attuned. From 70, I could give my heart and mind free reign without overstepping the boundaries. And if you've listened to previous episodes, you've heard me mention this quote before. Because to me, this is a blueprint for life, if any ever existed. Because Confucius is saying, when you are young, you should set your mind upon learning. Study the greatest books, study the greatest minds. And throughout the Analects, Confucius repeats over and over again that he loves learning. And this is why he's obviously imparting this wisdom onto his students. And he also later on says that he wasn't naturally gifted, but he became wise and skilled through his propensity towards learning. His continuous hunger for learning. So why do I think this is a blueprint for life? If we return back to this quote, from 15, my heart and mind was set upon learning. So Confucius saying, you should learn, spend your time studying, spend your time speaking to people who are wiser than you. And then he goes on to say, from 30, I took my stance. Because when you reach 30, if you've been doing this for a while, you'll have built convictions upon those learnings, upon speaking to wise people, upon studying wise people, upon studying books. And I think it's important to distinguish that convictions are not sets of dogmatic beliefs but are rather stances that you make upon certain ethical things. Things like you'll never kowtow to ideologies simply because other people are doing it around you. Right? You'll never succumb to peer pressure, but you're only able to get to this position and have this sort of conviction through learning, through practice, through meditation, and through walking the path. And that requires walking through the darkness. So Confucius goes on to say, at 40, I was no longer doubtful, meaning that you're no longer doubtful about these convictions. Because when you first build out convictions, you're never fully certain if this is where you should stand. But Confucius says, at 40, you no longer doubt these things. You no longer fear the opposition you'll face because of your stance. And that requires the one virtue we've mentioned multiple times, courage. So he goes on to say, at 50, I realized the propensity of Shan. The translators don't translate Shan. They just leave it as Shan. And reading their notes, it's because Shan is a very difficult term to translate in, into English because the closest word we have is heaven. But in classical Chinese, it doesn't simply mean heaven as in the ethereal place where there is no suffering that most people understand heaven to be. Where in classical Chinese, Shan is everything in the world, what a world is, how it is. Shan is order and order itself, that which is stitched into the fabric of all things. Sounds very similar to Tao. To learn more on that, check out the episode with Lao Tzu. So Shan is this thing that's, that pervades all things, including culture, human history, communities, creatures, and anything basically that exists. Shan is similar, as I said, to the Taoist Tao or the Buddhist Dharma. So when Confucius says, from 50, I realized the propensity of Shan. You are now in a place where you can understand the mandate of life. What life asks of you, calls upon you, where you understand what it means to live in this life and that this life is a gift. And then 
Confucius says, from 60, my ear was attuned. From 70, I could give my heart and mind free reign without overstepping the boundaries. At 60, you begin to hear Xian. You begin to see Xian. You begin to see the way you begin to hear the one speaking. When he says, from 70, I could give my heart and mind free reign without overstepping the boundaries. It means that you get to a point in your existence, in life, where what your heart and mind desires are truly aligned with what is good, what is true, and what is beautiful. There is no conflict into what you think, how you feel with Shan, with the way, with the one. You become essentially united to it because your whole life you've worked towards cultivating virtues, cultivating wisdom that when you get near to the end, you become indistinguishable from wisdom and virtue. So the full text again reads, From 15, my heart and mind was set upon learning. From 30, I took my stands. From 40, I was no longer doubtful. From 50, I realized the propensities of Shan. From 60, my ear was attuned. From 70, I could give my heart and my mind free reign without overstepping the boundaries. This is why I say if there's any blueprint in life, this is it. So Confucius goes on later in book 16, 7, stanza 7. And Confucius says, Exemplary persons have three kinds of conduct that they guard against. When young and vigorous, they guard against licentiousness. In their prime, when their vigor is at its height, they guard against conflict. In their old age, when their vigor is declining, they guard against acquisitiveness. To become wise, there are habits that you and I must cultivate. When you're young and full of energy, you have to guard against your mind wandering away from the way, wandering away from the path, being caught up in greed and power. And when you're in your prime and at the height of it, what you have to guard against, according to Confucius, is conflict. And this reminds me of Jiddu Krishnamurti. It was a few episodes ago that we did Krishnamurti. When Krishnamurti says, Our world is full of conflict and competition, and that is why our world is full of hatred, because we are always trying to compete and defeat each other. Sounds similar to what Confucius here is saying, right? Is to guard against conflict. So he goes on to say later on, Human beings are similar in their natural tendencies, but vary greatly by the virtue of their habits. You and I, first of all, are human beings. The main difference between you and I might be our skin color, our height, our weight. But for Confucius, the thing that distinguishes human beings, he says, are the virtue of their habits. It is what you do in the night. It is what you do when nobody is watching. It is what you do in the secret that makes you who you are. Your public persona could project this virtuous, kind, loving husband or wife. But deep down, when nobody's watching, you are the total opposite. Or your public persona is somebody who's articulate and wise and seems to know the intricacies of the law and all sorts of things. But then when it actually comes to living your life, when it actually comes to treating your wife, treating your husband, treating your friends, well, you don't know how to do it, right? You might know what it means to be a friend insofar as you have the knowledge for it abstractly. But in actual day-to-day life, in the actual implementation of this, that is where wisdom is and you totally lack that. And that's why Confucius says, human beings are similar in their natural tendencies, but vary greatly by the virtue of their habits. So you and I, our call is to cultivate habits that are good, habits that improve upon the characters that we want to improve upon. And the habits don't have to be big and grand at all. They can be small things. Things like when I sit down for a meal, no matter the size of the meal, no matter the time of the day, I will always say a prayer of gratitude. That's a small habit that over time will compound. Or say a habit of reading. Say you don't read much to begin with. Small habit is, let me pick up a book for five minutes every day at the end of the day or during my lunch break and read for five minutes. And you do this over time. You will, I guarantee you, learn to love reading and love to find time to read. And this is how habits are created and habits are formed. So in book 15, Confucius says, to demand much from oneself personally and not over much from others will keep ill will at a distance. Meaning, 
Don't judge where others are in relation to where you are. Each person walks their own journey and at their own pace. So our task is to focus our energy on where we're headed, not focus on where that person is going, where that person is failing, but focus on your energy, on where you're headed towards. What will you be like at 70? Will you be like Confucius, where what your heart desires and what your mind desires are aligned with what is good, beautiful, and true? Do you exist in a state of complete harmony? Or are you somebody at the age of 70 who still hasn't reined in their uncontrolled passions, who has failed to guard themselves from greed, lust, anger, hatred? As Jesus says, seek not to find a speck of dust in your brother's eye, but instead remove the log from your own eye. Confucius earlier in Book 2, 17 says to his student Zilu, Zilu, shall I teach you what wisdom means? To know what you know and know what you do not know. This then is wisdom. Sounds similar to what Socrates says, that I know that I know nothing. But in this case, related to the previous quote for Confucius, if you focus on other people, right? if you focus on where they're failing and never look upon where you are, then you only know, know what you know and fail to realize that there is an enormous amount of things that you do not know and you should be spending more time and you should be spending your energy slowly learning these things that you don't know. So for Confucius, somebody who pretends to know it all is somebody who is lacking wisdom and is somebody who is filled with folly. So Confucius has in book 15 multiple stanzas where he starts off talking about what an exemplary person is. And I'm going to read a few. The master said, exemplary persons are distressed by their own lack of ability, not by the failure of others to acknowledge them. Exemplary persons make demands on themselves, while petty persons make demands on others. When you understand that it is your life that you're living, and it is only your life that you can control, and only your attitudes that you can control, then you will stop making demands on other people and wanting other people to change. Instead, you will focus on making great demands upon yourself, whether that's demands around your virtues, whether that's demands around your habits, whether that's demands around how you treat other people. When you start doing that, for Confucius, you become an exemplary person. You become a wise person. But if you get caught up in gossip in how other people are living their lives and how they're failing to do this, you become a petty person, according to Confucius. So on the point about learning, Confucius makes a very strong point throughout the whole of the Analects that it is learning that made him wise. So he says in book 12, Learn broadly of culture, discipline this learning through observing ritual propriety, and moreover, in so doing, remain on course without straying from it. As I mentioned, the first call that Confucius has for a student is to learn. Because without learning, there is no growth. And without learning, we become fools. You make silly mistakes in life, in business, in relationships that could have easily been avoided had you only learned by studying. So with learning, you live a life of less regret. You live a life where you stay on course. And so Confucius says, Reviewing the old as a means of realizing the new, such a person can be considered a teacher. Meaning, if you study if you study the books of old, if you engage in conversation with older people, people who've walked this life before you, and realize that it is only by looking back and reflecting that you'll know how to live well in this new world that you're entering. And this is true of not just life, but true of history in general. If you don't know history, you will end up making mistakes that other people have made in the past. So on the point about reflecting and studying old, Confucius says, learning without due reflection leads to perplexity. Reflection without learning leads to perilous circumstances. Meaning to read for the sake of impressing others, right? To learn for the sake of impressing others is totally useless. Yet to study, to understand so that we can grow in love, we can build our convictions, we can become wise, we can make better decisions in life, to see a new perspective is how it should be. Hence, learning without reflection leads to a cluttered mind, a mind that cannot move because it is bogged down by so-called knowledge. All this knowledge that you've gained, that you've never implemented, 
it will stunt your life. And Confucius understands this. That's why he says, learning without due reflection leads to perplexity. Yet reflecting without learning leads to confusion because your mind cannot parse truth from falsity. Your mind cannot see the difference between wisdom and folly because there is no mechanism, there is no framework for you to parse through all this knowledge, all this experience that you're having. So Confucius says, there are in a town of 10,000 bound to be people who are better than I am in doing their utmost and in making good on their word, but there will be no one who can compare with me in the love of learning. To do your utmost and to make good on your word, these are like two crucial points that Confucius makes over and over again. But for him, he said, nobody can compare with me in the love of learning. And this is what made Confucius wise. It was his love of wanting to grow, to learn. Again, he says later on that he's not gifted. In book seven, Confucius says, I am not the kind of person who has gained knowledge through some natural propensity for it. Rather, loving antiquity, I am earnest in seeking it out. And this is why he says later on, there are probably those who can initiate new paths while still not understanding them, but I am not one of them. I learn much, select out of it what works well, and then follow it. I observe much and remember it. This is a lower level of wisdom. It's funny how he doesn't consider himself to be wise in this higher level sense. But he says, I am wise in this lower level sense because I observe it and then I remember it. I learn and then I select what works and then I apply it. I follow it. I walk the way. And this is why we're looking at these books and studying these books is to see what we can learn from it, to select out what works and then for us to be able to implement it and follow it and add it to our repertoire. In book 13, stanza 27, Confucius says, being firm, resolute, honest, and deliberate in speech is close to authoritative conduct. It reminds me of a quote when Bruce Lee says, you know, the point of our life is to be able to express oneself honestly. You can only speak firmly, honestly, deliberately if you know what you're going to say. And more importantly, if you truly believe in what you speak, that is what makes the biggest difference. Without conviction in your speech, you are are a resounding gong. You're unsure about what you're saying and what you're saying doesn't sound correct, doesn't sound right to the ears of those who listen. But with conviction, you, your speech penetrates into the mind and the hearts of those that are engaging with you because when you're speaking, there's a tremendous weight behind what you say. And you'll always notice when a person is speaking on a subject abstractly versus somebody who speaks authoritatively, somebody who speaks with conviction, not because they've somehow found the magical key to all of this, but because the person who speaks with conviction, with authority, is precisely because they've lived it, they've experienced it, or they're continually practicing it. And this is something that will come over time. You do not just wake up one day and become very firm and resolute and honest and deliberate in your speech if you've never done this before. But the goal, as we mentioned earlier, is by the time that you're 70, what you say, you say with conviction, you express yourself honestly, deliberately, and firmly without fear of what the other person might think of you, might say about you. Earlier in the Analects, Confucius says in Book 2, stanza 22, I'm not sure that anyone who does not make good on their word is viable as a person. If a large carrier does not have the pin for its yoke or a small carriage does not have the pin for its crossbar, how can you drive them anywhere? And then later on in book 14, he says, the exemplary person takes a high road while the petty person takes a low road. And again, in the same book, he says, the exemplary person would feel shame if their words were better than their deeds. The point Confucius is making is you must be somebody of integrity. When you say you're going to do something, you're going to do it. When you say you're not going to do something, you're not going to do it. But to go back and forth between these two positions, for Confucius, somebody who goes back and forth on this, he says, is viable as a person because you cannot trust him. Returning to the last quote, which is uh, from book 
14, stanza 27. The exemplary person would feel shame if their words were better than their deeds. In this age of social media, most of us rather be known for pithy phrases that go viral than actually living a life worthy of emulating. All right, what does that say about us? What does that say about us as a culture? Namely, that we've rejected wisdom as a whole. But that's not you and I. In book two, one of Confucius' student, Zingong, asked about exemplary persons, and Confucius replied with, they first accomplish what they are going to say and only then say it, meaning they are not talkers but doers, and they only talk when they've done what they say they're going to do. Again, Confucius says, the ancients were loath to speak because they would be ashamed if they personally did not live up to what they said. There's a story attributed to Francis of Assisi when he says, preach the gospel always and use words when necessary. And Francis of Assisi didn't actually say this, it's just attributed to him. But the message, however, is clear. Now, your actions are more important than your words. Your life is more of a testament to the philosophies of your life that you implemented than the words that you actually speak. Words will always be important, no doubt about it. The words and the ideas are always going to be greater than the one who speaks it. But it's very important that what you speak and how you live are not in conflict with each other. One of Confucius' student was concerned that he would learn something before he'd actually implemented the previous thing that he has learned. So in book 5, 14, when Zulu had learned something but had not yet been able to act upon it, his only fear was that he would learn something more. Humans in general are prone to chase for new experiences, new knowledge. And you see this most often in this age of speed that we're living in where everybody is showing off on where they're going on holidays, the vacationing that they're doing, the new cars that they've bought, the new houses they've bought, the new clothes that they're having, the new experience that they're having with people, and always going from one thing to another thing to another thing. And this is the case even with people who love learning, that if they're not careful and if they don't rein this in, you will chase after knowledge as if it is some sort of drug, never really implementing the knowledge and turning it into wisdom. You have to be willing to exist in the ambiguity of figuring out how to implement this. And only then, once you've done it, then should you go out and learn something new. I really like this quote from Confucius from book four, when he says, When you meet persons of exceptional character, think to stand shoulder to shoulder with them. Meeting persons of little character, look inward and examine yourself. What that shows us is... There is always something to learn from everybody, no matter if they're superior to you or no matter if they're inferior to you. In any room that you step into, you will always be both superior to somebody and inferior to somebody. And somebody who you might be inferior to, you will be superior to them in other areas and vice versa. So there will always be somebody who knows more about law than you. There will always be somebody who knows more about biology than you. There will always be somebody who knows more about politics, history. There will always be somebody who knows less about business than you, physics than you, philosophy than you. So the goal here for us with what Confucius says here is when you meet somebody of exceptional character specifically, that you are able to stand shoulder to shoulder with them, meaning you elevate yourself, right? You elevate your character to meet them where they are instead of bringing them down. And when you meet somebody of little character or less character than you, instead of judging them and deriding them, you look inward and examine yourself and see where in your life you are lacking. I mean, this is tremendous wisdom. And it's crazy that, it's crazy that these are principles from 2,500 years ago. And so for us, it's to remain humble, always attending first to our attitude, to ourselves, so that when you're in a crowd of people who are superior, inferior, more exemplary, more exceptional, less character, you can remain in that crowd without collapsing inwards and thinking that you're not good enough and thinking that you should not be in this place or without having your ego explode. Later on, Confucius says, the exemplary person wants to be slow to speak yet quick to act. You want to be slow to speak because you want to think clearly and understand 
the actions that you're about to take. But when you do act, you want to act quickly. You don't want to second guess yourself. You don't want to half-heartedly do what you're doing. You want to do it fully and exceptionally well. Another maxim from Confucius in Book 4, stanza 16, he says, Exemplary persons understand what is appropriate. Petty persons understand what is of personal advantage. This gets to something we've discussed before in the idea of seeking social status and climbing corporate ladders and snaking your way onto tables. Like That is considered normal. That is considered praiseworthy in our time. It is common to make friends simply because these new friends give you access to this new world, to this new table, to this new status. Right? Because somehow these friends are more powerful, more connected, more wealthy, more famous. But for Confucius, it's the same thing was happening back back during ancient China. And what he observed was that only petty persons do this. An exemplary person understands the world, sees the facade, sees the illusion of all of this, and only seeks to live better in his heart and in his mind. So Confucius says, Wealth and honor are what people want, but if they are the consequences of deviating from the way, I would have no part in them. Poverty and disgrace are what people deplore but if they are the consequences of staying on the way i would not avoid them wherein do the exemplary persons who would abandon their authoritative conduct warrant that name exemplary persons do not take leave of their authoritative conduct even for the space of a meal when they are troubled they certainly turn to it as they do in facing difficulties if you get wealth and honor in deplorable ways in malicious ways through lying and cheating, through manipulating and destroying lives and deviating from the way Confucius wants no part in it. And he'd rather be poor and disgraceful, even though that is what society deplores, if he is poor and disgraced as a consequence of staying on the the path. This right here is a man of standard. This right here is a man who is willing to put his money where his mouth is. There's a gentleman that I follow. His name is Brunello Cuccinelli. He's an Italian businessman. When I started reading up on Brunello Cuccinelli, one thing that stood out to me was something that he said in an interview. In one interview, Cuccinelli said, people and companies and corporations want to be seen as doing good work in this world once they have gone to be extremely wealthy and they want to repaint the image that they created while they were climbing the ladder where up until they got extremely wealthy, they were totally malicious, totally rude, manipulative, exploitive. But once they got fame, they're like, you know what? I want to change this image of me, so I'm going to create a foundation to start giving money. And Cuccinelli said, don't tell me that you're giving all this money away for good causes. Show me instead how you made that money. And for Cuccinelli, it was very important to him, while he was building his business, that he would treat people well, that he would treat people with humanity, and that he would always be working towards making and creating a better world throughout the whole time as he's building this business. And I think in terms of like modern business, Cuccinelli is an example that does this very well, right? The first part where, as Confucius says, wealth and honor are what people want, but if they are the consequences of deviating from the way, I would have no part in them. In book 13, Confucius is asked about how to govern well and what ministers should do. He replies by saying, don't try to rush things and don't get distracted by small opportunities. If you try to rush things, you won't achieve your end. If you get distracted by small opportunities, you won't succeed in the more important matters of government. Though he's specifically referring to government, generally this principle of not rushing and not getting distracted by small opportunities is applicable to our life. Oftentimes, we want to rush whatever it is that we're doing to get it done so that we can do the next thing. And oftentimes, it's easy to get distracted by shiny things. It's easy to get distracted by small opportunities that come here and there. But as Confucius says, if you try to rush things, you won't achieve your end. And your end should be to do the things excellently. And if you get distracted by small opportunities, as Confucius also says, you won't succeed in the more important matters because the small opportunities will will pull you away from your ultimate goal. Later on in book 15, he says, related to this idea that we're talking about, quote, tradesmen wanting to be good at their trade must first sharpen their tools. 
you and I have to dedicate ourselves to whatever craft that we are doing. We have to be patient. We have to be willing to sharpen the tool and also to not get distracted. And the craft could be anything. It could be an actual trade. It could be art. It could be music. It could be programming. It could be running a business. Whatever it is, you have to be willing to sharpen your tools first. Only then do you get good at the trade. So Confucius says much later on when he's talking about students coming to him and asking him questions, he says, I do not open the way for students who are not driven with eagerness. I do not supply a vocabulary for students who are not trying desperately to find the language for their ideas. If on showing students one corner, they do not come back to me with the other three, I will not repeat myself. (laughs) I think this is a great way of emphasizing that you and I must do the work that teachers and sages and philosophers are only pointing the way. They're pointing the way, but if we're not careful, we will often mistake their finger for the way and start start to dogmatize and start adding isms and being, being part of this school and not that school and creating competition and creating divisions. Instead of learning from these sages and understanding that they're simply pointing us to the way. And so for Confucius, it's that simply that if he shows a student one thing and the student doesn't come back with three more things to add to whatever the Confucius said, then he's not going to repeat himself to them. A strong stance, in my opinion, but it is what Confucius says. Later on, goes on to say, I cannot understand people who are impetuous yet lacking in discipline, who are slow yet lacking in caution, and who are simple yet lacking in honesty. Meaning, if you're already slow, then be cautious and use that to your advantage. If you're already simple, then use that to your advantage and be honest. Do excellent work. In book 9, stanza 16, it reads, The master was standing on the riverbank and observed, Isn't life passing just like this, never ceasing day or night? Whether you like it or not, life is passing you every moment. And with each moment, your probability of dying increases. Mortality draws near with each breath that you take. And it's an important reminder to not be obsessed with trying to stop time, trying to capture time or to hold it because it will fall through your fingers like water. Instead, the call is to step into the river of time. Feel the water passing you. Feel the stones underneath you that sometimes will hurt you and be willing to bask in the sun and enjoy the flow of time. And in this process of stepping into time, A very important thing here is having relationships. And on this point, Confucius says, excellent persons do not dwell alone. They are sure to have neighbors. It was Krishnamurti who made the comment that the goal of life is not to escape the world and go into monasteries and caves, but to face life and transform it through living with each other and transforming yourself. Because the world is a reflection of you. The temptation is always there to draw away from society, to bask yourself in learning these great works and never having to engage in the world. But as Confucius says, as Krishnamurti says, a wise person, an excellent person will never dwell alone. They will always have neighbors because it is only in having neighbors that you are able to sharpen your character, sharpen your virtues. How can you practice love if you do not have somebody who's difficult to love? How can you practice patience if you do not experience the urge to get angry at a situation? In book 11, one of Confucius' student, Zilu, asks how to serve spirits and gods. And Confucius said, not yet being able to serve other people, how would you be able to serve the spirits? Zilu said, may I ask about death? The master replied, Not yet understanding life, how can you understand death? Death in classical uh, Chinese is interesting because it is not something perverse or horrible. It's natural. It's something that happens to all of us. It's also not something to be feared, even though the fear is common. Confucius in the Analects says, it is not something to fear if you have faced it. And now getting to the quote that I mentioned in episode 2 with Leo Tolstoy. In book four, stanza eight, Confucius says, If at dawn you learn off and tread the way, you can face death at dusk. Though it is true 
Death is not something perverse and horrible. It's a natural process of life. Many, many people have never faced immortality. Many, many people are afraid of dying, are afraid that they might not wake up tomorrow. And yet Confucius says, if at dawn you learn of, you learn of death and you tread the way, right? you do the work to your utmost ability, you express yourself honestly, you have built a conviction, what your heart and your mind desires is aligned with what is good, with Shan, with the way, then when you face death at dusk, you will not be afraid because you have lived a life worthy of emulating. You've lived a life worthy of your calling. And for this week's challenge, I want to end with this quote from book one, stanza four. Daily, I examine my person on three counts. In my understanding, on behalf of other people, have I failed to do my utmost? In my interactions with colleagues and friends, have I failed to make good on my word? In what has been passed on to me, have I failed to carry it into practice? This is a great way for us to implement wisdom. The question is, have I failed to do my utmost in my work, in my task, in my relationships? Second, have I failed to keep my word? Have I done all the things I said I'll do today, this week, this month? Have I kept my word with my friends, with my spouse, with my family? And finally, have I implemented what I know into practice or are they still abstractly floating in my head and not present in my life? And with that, I'll wrap. Thank you for listening to this episode. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at ij at becomingantifragile.com and you can leave a comment if you are using Spotify. Otherwise, give this podcast a five star on Apple Podcast or Spotify or wherever else you listen to. It helps to spread the word. And if you've enjoyed this and learned something, share it with a friend. Until next week, peace. Mm-hmm.